Okay, Mayor, it's three o'clock. Okay, call the meeting to order to be the work session for February 2021 of the Marin City Council of the City of Frostburg. Uh, roll call whenever you're ready, Elizabeth. Sure. Commissioner Donnie Carter. Here. Commissioner Nina Forsyth. Here. Commissioner Kevin Grove. Here. Commissioner Adam Ritchie. Here. And Mayor Robert Flanagan. Uh, I'm here, Liz. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, council meeting topics whenever you're ready to go, Liz. Okay. Um, for the first item, I'm not sure um, if this will end up on this month's council meeting, but it potentially could. So I put it here. Um, and I have Brian, I believe, on the call. Yep, Brian's here. So I'll kind of give you a <clears throat> brief overview and then I'll let Brian talk a little bit more about the conversations he's had. Um, a business owner in Allegheny County is looking to expand his operations. Um, it was on Facebook, so it's public knowledge, but uh, Lash Balls Bar and Grill is looking to do a Lash, ball or Lash Balls West. Um, at the Frostburg Moose. Um, the city does own the pavilion behind the Moose, um, but that pavilion has came to be in partnership with the city and the Moose um, many decades ago um, and has been primarily been used by the Moose. Um, Mr. Lashball approached Brian about um, having a the option of buying or renting um, that pavilion for the year. And um, because he really thinks that's part of his business model in terms of crab feeds and other things like that. And um, preliminarily, um, what Brian proposed and he was agreeable to was a yearly lease rate of $1,000. Um, he'd have exclusive rights to it. Um, he would maintain the grass and bathrooms, you know, regular maintenance type things. And the city would still own it and retain rights for sled riding on the hill. That's probably the most valuable recreation asset that we have there at this point is the sled riding hill. Um, Brian, did you, would you chime in and talk to a Talk to us a little bit more about your conversations and uh, the rec commission discussion. You're on mute. There we go. <laughs> Better? Yes. Yep, hear you. Okay, good. Um, yes, as, as Liz was saying, I have spoken with uh, Jim Lashbar in regard to the property. Um, he indicated he did want to use specifically the pavilion in the backside there. Um, he was talking about doing some outdoor dining options and possibly bands. Um, I did talk to him about the band situation as far as it being a residential neighborhood. He was well aware of that. He did say that um, any any type of music that he would bring outside, he would be contacting the city about. He doesn't want to create any disturbances there. Uh, he said he, his plan was to, if he did want to do that, that he would actually be talking to the neighbors in the area as well uh, to make sure that you know whatever he did, he didn't create any problems, was compliant with what the city had requested. Um, he, he did definitely have an interest in the property. So that's when I, of course, uh, spoke with Elizabeth about it. <clears throat> Anything else you want me to cover, Liz? Do we, do we have any idea, like, how much revenue does that place <laughs> produce in a year just on regular rentals? Uh, pretty much none, to be honest. Um, uh, over the last three years, I think we've rented the pavilion once. Uh, it's just not a, a requested facility uh, for whatever reason. I, I know there's one of the reasons, obviously, is, is there's nothing else recreational there. Uh, with a lot of the other ones, we have fields, playgrounds, swimming pool, things like that, that are right next to the pavilions. 
uh, in the case of West End, there's really nothing there other than the pavilion and the restrooms. Um, so it's, it's just not a highly requested facility. Um, you know, any income we could get off of that is obviously a benefit to us. Um, and one of the things I guess we would require of the agreement would be some sort of maintenance for, I guess, the park area itself. Oh, of course, by doing so, that would take the load off of our guys that are actually doing the maintenance at that building and in that park. So, Brian, do you, do you think that we, in a contract with him, that we should put some limit, time limit on what time he could have the music? In other words, I know down at his place now, the music goes till 10, 11 o'clock at night, and you're in a pretty open area where, where this is. I think we already have something. On, uh, some he was. Says, oh, go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. He, he was aware of that. He said he did not plan any type of late night music out there. Um, and I, I did. I think Donnie was about to say something about uh, the ordinance and the, the timing of that. Is that correct, Don? Yeah, I, I thought we already had an ordinance in place for something like that. Like a ten, in there a 10 o'clock ordinance. Because then we have something with, with some stuff on Main Street not too long ago. We do have a noise ordinance and that zoning district up there, I believe on that side of the street is residential. Um, I don't have the map in front of me, but uh, so by the virtue of the zoning district that makes uh, loud amplified music inappropriate um, as we've been through this before. Um, <laughs> and uh, we can certainly craft an agreement that uh, really does protect the city and the residents in terms of noise issues. If he has acoustic acts out there, then that would probably be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, well, I, well, good, good luck yeah, on that. And his, business, <laughs> his business now, I know that they're not acoustic acts. They are, yeah. they're, they're pretty, they can get pretty loud and, and I wouldn't want to run him off because it's a good idea, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, I can see the police department getting a lot of calls if if the music goes too long. We do need to we need to hammer and that I, the agreement beforehand. Yeah, I mean we just dealt with this. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, yeah, so let, let, let's not open that can of worms again. Yeah, yeah, and he he did seem agreeable over the phone. He did seem to indicate that he wanted to comply with whatever regulations there were. He again, he did mention that he wanted to talk to the neighbors before he did anything like that. So he sounds like he's he wants to move in the right direction with this and doesn't want to cause any problems for the city. <clears throat> I have not talked to the city attorney about whether we would do a formal lease agreement or could just do like a exclusive rental agreement. Um, so if you're okay with me, with this in concept, um, I will talk to Michael Cohen and uh, get his advice on how we would best handle this and protect the city um, in, in moving forward with such an agreement. I think having it be a lease agreement rather than a sale, which is something that he had also um, expressed interest, it gives us some leverage so that if he doesn't comply we can cancel the lease. So if we yes. write it in the lease agreement, I think that gives us the power to, you know, make sure that it's not an annoyance to the neighbors. Yes. Are we okay with letting uh, Liz proceed with Mike Cohen? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you. Mm -hmm. The next item is a real estate tech set aside agreement for Pritchard Farms phase 1A3, um, or as we commonly refer to it as a RETSA. Um, last June 30th, the mayor and council 
um, approved a RETSA charter. I'm, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, RETSA charter extension so that um, additional RETSA applications could be accepted for an additional seven years. Um, right now, there are two active RETSA agreements, uh, one for Pritchard Farms Phase 1AB and one for uh, Sand Spring Run Phase 2A I believe, and B. I, there's too many phases, but Sand Spring Run 2 and uh, Pritchard Farms 1AB. Um, as a reminder, what the RETSA does is it sets aside a portion, in this case, 75% um, of the taxes collected off of the improved value. So you buy a lot <coughs> that's worth 50,000 or assessed at 50,000, you build a $250,000 house and now becomes assessed at 300,000. The RETSA applies to that difference of between the um, new assessed value of 300 and the original assessed value of 50. Um, so we set aside 75% of the $250,000 increase for a period of time. The developer documents their expenses in building infrastructure that will become the cities. So that is streets, water lines, sewer lines, and stormwater conveyance lines. Um, and the soft costs that go along with that. And annually, the developer can request reimbursement of those set aside funds uh, for 15 years after the home is built. So um, uh, unless you would like me to go into more detail, um, I will, uh, but that mm -hmm. is the top level summary um, and it's we've been through this before. Um, this, when we do sign a RETSA agreement, it also serves as the developer's agreement which requires the bonding be in place for the construction and stipulates um, the city receiving as built and the project being complete to the city standards before any RETSA monies are released back to the developer. So uh, by <clears throat> doing this, uh, this is tied into the land development process in terms of getting the development agreement in place. Um, that's the, the more lengthy, um, nature of this agreement. Um, some of the attachments are, they're all here, I believe. I've had so many versions, I can't keep it straight. So um, the bond amount has been approved, um, but the resolution would be written as such that the um, mayor would not sign the RETSA agreement until the bond has been provided and approved by the city attorney. Um, that's very important in protecting the city in any resident in any subdivision development like this. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, if that's the case, there will be a resolution um, on next next week's agenda for you to approve the real estate tax set aside. For mm -hmm. Pritchard Farms, one A three. One A three. Okay. Um, the next item is the Municipal Center project. Uh, that update is the update is that it's coming along well. Um, unfortunately, it looks less finished on the outside than it is on the inside. Um, there is some green boards on the building that are still exposed. Those will get um, ACM panels, which are aluminum, aluminum composite material panels. Um, those are not here yet um, in production. So it is likely that they will not be installed until after uh, everyone moves into the new building. And because of weather, um, the lot won't be paved until later in March or April when the blacktop plants open. Um, but everything else is coming along really nicely. Um, one item that was not in the original scope of work, um, but the chief and uh, the contractor and I discussed 
um, some cost-effective upgrades for the juvenile detention cell. Um, there's just a standard toilet and standard porcelain sink and um, a, like an old metal bathroom partition in there that was in poor condition. And uh, the contractor had recommended some cost-effective but tamper-proof uh, commode and sink. So um, he's working on an, a partition that is just um, sturdy and not rickety like what was there uh, to, for privacy. So he's working on a um, estimate for that change order. Um, I expect that uh, we'll have that in the next couple of days. So that would be on your agenda for next week. It's pretty cost effective, the solution that's been proposed rather than um, the traditional um, detention cell toilet, stainless steel toilets, they're very expensive. Um, but this was kind of a compromise where we could use existing plumbing and uh, get some affordable options. So if there's any, do you have any questions on that change order? So what are they made of then? <laughs> they're still made of porcelain, but they have like um, uh, surrounds that go on them. So they can't break the plumbing I see. and fl flood the cell. I mean, generally there isn't an issue. Um, we don't house very many juveniles and generally I don't think there's been an issue, but um, uh, Mike had made us aware of these tamper proof uh, objects that like go on top of a standard toilet or underneath a standard sink. So. Sounds good. Okay. Um, move in um, at this time furniture. Well, furniture is coming on February 22nd that week. It'll be delivered and installed that week. Um, our communication stuff is being worked on and installed now and will continue to be worked on over the next couple weeks. The upstairs <coughs> is near completion, um, save for some door hardware, a couple doors, and some flooring in the lobby. Um, so that's very exciting to see. The bathrooms are completely done. And uh, downstairs, uh, the flooring still needs to go in. Uh, they were working on the lobby uh, yesterday when I was up there. So it's, it's really coming along nicely. Um, I expect after the furniture is delivered, there's probably gonna be some punch list items. And I'm, in my mind, it would just be best to not try and move in while they're trying to resolve those punch list items. So um, likely moving dates, Police department will come first and then City Hall, but between um, March 8th and uh, March 21st, I expect we'll get the moving complete. So that's about a two and a half week window. So. Very good. Any other questions on that? Everybody's good? Okay. Yep. And then um, Ordinance 2021-01, not 02, sorry, um, is the ordinance that was a, introduced last month at a council meeting regarding exempting rental housing registrations. So that public hearing is scheduled for this month. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that would be on the agenda. Yeah. Okay. Um, next, Elaine um, has, we've gotten, <coughs> what we're going to be presenting uh, today is just budget requests. Uh, we don't have near enough information to even try to get to put together um, what would look like the normal budget sheets. So um, Elaine will go over it and uh, I might chime in with a few items as she goes along. Thank you, Elizabeth. So at this point in our budget cycle, each of the departments has um, submitted their initial requests after a consultation with the commissioners. And this tends to be the non-recurring items, I would say, uh, for the budget. 
And so I've tried to provide a summary to you of kind of the highlights of these items from each department. And there's, as Elizabeth mentioned, between now and next month is when we actually put these requests together with the regular operating expenses and our revenue projections to come up with a draft budget. So there are several items that um, Elizabeth has brought to my attention that affect multiple departments. And I've listed those first. First of all, it is potential employee salary increases and related benefit expenses. No determination has been made there, but that would affect all departments. For the cell phones currently, uh, certain employees receive a cell phone stipend each month and the city is going to be um, looking to move into a different plan wherein the employees would have work provided cell phones and this would be through FirstNet and we would discontinue the individual employee cell phone stipends. Another change citywide would affect our radios. Uh, we would be switching from the TWR radio service to a more FCC compliant service that would, we would work through the county. We would have to purchase the radios though. So that would be a one-time expense that we would need to budget for this year. And primarily that is for the street and water departments. We would also like to budget for some personal safety expenses that would affect all the outside departments. And we know that there's a repair that needs to be done over the city place parking lot with that wall and that cost has not been determined yet, but we're approximating somewhere around $15,000. And also the enterprise fleet lease for this coming year, enterprise has not provided us with the cost that we'll be budgeting for, but there have been discussions about what types of vehicles will be needed and how that will be scheduled. So we expect that information to be forthcoming. As far as individual department requests, um, there's a list, I won't read each of the items to you, but some items for consideration would be a new city website. We do have another election cycle coming up. So depending on the form of the election, that would affect the budgeted expense there. And with our new phone system, we're gonna have some annual licensing fees. So that will be a potential um, increase and maybe a new budget line item there. As always, we have our financial audit each year and the actuarial study and those budget estimates are based on the cost proposals that we have. For community development, we still have the comprehensive plan update that's needed. And there's been a request to budget $35,000 towards a consultant to assist with that process. We have some pending community legacy applications. So we are awaiting um, determination about those grant applications as to whether that expense will be in the budget or not. Uh, with public works, we have the upcoming retirement of our public works director. So depending on how that process goes, that will impact our budgeting in that department for this coming year. From the police and public safety, they've made a request to increase the city's contribution to the police enhancement through the ICMA 457. Currently, if the employee makes a contribution of 1% of their base pay, the city contributes 4%. And there's been a request from the department to consider increasing that contribution from the city to 5%. Um, there's the potential that we would be looking at police body cameras. And at this point, we do not know a cost or the requirements so that will be a discussion item in the coming months. And the police are the only ones who had any expense decreases. So did note that. For the street department, in the past few years, we have been budgeting for the rental of a seasonal loader to help with salt. And the desire again is to be able to find a piece of equipment that we can buy next year. So that was their capital request. In the recreation department, with the increases in minimum wage, there's been an increase recommended there for those seasonal salaries and an incentive for returning staff. And that include, that's not just daycare 
um, day camp staff, that's also for the pool. And as far as I remember, there's also a capital outlay request. Um, Brian probably has it right with him. Um, I believe there was uh, a pool item that was needed in the range of maybe $6,000 of some kind of a pool controller. Brian can chime in there. Correct, yes. Um, that was a, a chemical controller for the pool. The existing controller is approximately 15 years old and is getting a little, little touch and go at times. Um, so uh, put in a request to replace that. And there was also a request in the rec department for a dump trailer that would be around $6,500. Yes, and that, and that was mainly for uh, trail maintenance because of the increase in the number of trails now at Mount Pleasant and Hoffman and Glen Denning as well. I apologize for omitting them from this list. Um, for the the water department, both on the supply side and the distribution side, Chris Hovetter has worked extensively with Mark Kaiser from MES to come up with a list of priorities of projects needed both at the water treatment plant and also at the hydro facility. And you can see that itemized list there that Chris has identified of, of projects that ideally would be completed in the upcoming year. The water department I'd like to continue to increase their meter budget as we work towards replacing the oldest meters with the new technology of the radio red meters. So they have asked for an increase of $3,000 in the meter fund and they have a couple pieces of small equipment that they would like to purchase. The large items in the sewer fund always relate to the CSO projects. So we have completion of phase 9B. We also have phase 9C, which would be starting, and the design of 9A. So those are all rough estimates at this point, about $3.8 million. And also in the works is the Talcott pump station replacement. That's under design right now. So we're looking at an approximate cost around $260,000 to actually complete that project. I think the design is for 10A, right? Not 9A. Design is for 10A of CSO. Yeah. Yeah. And um, similar to water supply, Chris has identified some projects at Piney Dam of projects, uh, the big one being a cone valve replacement at $25,000 and then some other miscellaneous items. And for the garbage fund, we've identified a need to increase the landfill line item as the landfill costs continue to increase each year. So that's just a, a quick summary of some of the, the departmental requests. And as we mentioned, there's all the other multitude of line items that we have to consider looking at past history or projections of upcoming events. But these are the, the items that the departments have specifically itemized. Anything you would like these, to add? These, these phones that we're looking at getting, um, what what type of phones are they? I mean, I'm just curious. Is it a smartphone? Is it a like a flip phone? Um, it's a one of those old Nokia's. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now it's like bag phones. Carry. Yeah, so they, I used to. <laughs> There's a couple options that the employees will be able to choose from. They can get an Apple iPhone 11 or SEXR or something, or there's an Android-based platform of a um, indestructible phone that has a three-year warranty that comes with it in terms of damage. In talking to our employees about cell phones, I learned about some creative ways we've managed to damage personal cell phones, like dropping them in a can of paint or <laughs> there's been a lot of things um, that would be um, right now <clears throat> we reimburse for a portion of their cell phone bill. There's a lot of potential issues that come with that in terms of 
Is it city property? Is it um, work property? Um, there's times that people are communicating on their phone via text that if um, something were to occur that I would have a very difficult time retrieving that information potentially if there was a Public Information Act request. Um, you think about the police that are using their phones to take pictures of crime scenes and at the same time are taking pictures of their children um, with their phone. And uh, it's going to be a hassle for certain people um, to have two phones, but I think it is in the best interest of the city. FirstNet is a network built by AT&T uh, through a federal 25 year contract uh, that came about um, under a recommendation from the 9-11 commission. Um, and as I'm sure you remember after that incident, uh, all the cell networks were jammed and people couldn't communicate. So um, the federal government sought a network that would be dedicated to first responders and allied uh, agencies, which our employees would generally fall under. So what that guarantees us in the event of an emergency, whether it's weather or terrorism, um, is that we would have a very high likelihood of still having cell phone coverage. Um, one of the interesting examples they gave me was in after a hurricane and all of the down in Florida, I think all of the cell towers were taken out and they put up a blimp with a cell uh, antenna in it and were able to provide a hundred miles radius of coverage with that blimp. So, um, but it has equal or better coverage than AT&T, generally better. Um, we were given two sample phones and it's cost neutral to the city. Um, there may be, there, we have a few officers that don't get a stipend. Um, so th there might be a little bit of an increase to just make that consistent, but generally it, the cost per month per phone is what we pay for the stipend. Good. Thanks. Yep. Uh, that radio ask is a big ask of $68,000 plus more for the water department. Um, I guess I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. Right mm -hmm. now we have one antenna um, that we have on a tower that TWR maintains for us. Um, that's why we don't get good coverage with our radio system is because you need at least two towers. So half of the time people can hear, but people can't talk back or like we've had goofy things where we can hear in the office when someone calls in and then we can relay that. But you know, it, it's, it's just really not effective to have a good radio system. We would need to put up another antenna and to be FCC compliant, we do need to upgrade all of our radios regardless. Um, however, several years ago, the county went to new digital Motorola technology under um, the state program and they reserved channels for all of the uh, infrastructure departments at all of the uh, jurisdictions in the county. So there are channels reserved for us and we could get a basic radio, but because they're digital radios, they do cost more. So they would be a little over $4,000 installed for each of them. Um, it's really important for the street department uh, because they're out plowing um, need to be communicating with each other, cannot be using their cell phones generally. We don't want them having to flip through numbers. We want them to be able to pick up and talk to their whole department. Um, and then we need to put it in the equipment too. So like the loader and the backhoe because they're loading trucks with that. So that's important communication too. So um, I talked to Roger Bennett in depth about this. He's the one that helped me get this far. Uh, State Highway is moving to this system and County Roads is in the same part of discussions as uh, the city is right now. So it would also expand the capability for uh, county, for us to talk to County Roads and State Highway. And this would also put us on the same um, digital system that our police department uses. So um, that again is another benefit that our 
street department could directly talk uh, to any of our police officers that are out in the field. I, I wonder if we can get a better deal is if we piggyback in with the with the county. You know? I don't know. So, so that is the state bid pricing. Okay. Okay. Um, Rogers, work. From what I understand, like the state has a preferred vendor for this, and you kind of the radios have different features, and they are working on specking out a very basic radio for us. There's other brands, but Roger has warned me that when you use other brands other than a Motorola radio on the Motorola system, um, you lose functionality. They're still interoperable, but you lose functionality. So. Um, the county pays, the county has grant money that they pay for the purchase of the radios and the installation of the radios for our police department. And that is, that's a huge um, benefit to us. So sure. the good thing is, is long-term we reduce um, maintenance costs because we don't have to maintain any antennas. But what kind of brought this to light was with the uh, the street department's gotten one, water department's gotten one, and the street department's expecting two new vehicles under the enterprise fleet lease in the next few months. So um, just need direction as to um, how we're gonna equip those vehicles. Makes sense. What else? Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or concerns um, about other items brought to light? <coughs> okay, we're good. Thanks, Liz. The other item that we need to, to have consideration of is the mayor and council's interest in changing the tax rate, the real estate tax rate, the personal property tax rate, and also your view on utility rates. Because as we work towards a draft budget, um, we need to have a guideline of, of your opinion on these matters. We did have a tax rate increase last year of two cents for $100 of assessed value. That was the first increase in four years. Um, we also had an increase in the water, sewer, and garbage rates. So, like some input from the mayor and council regarding these issues. Elaine, if you could give us uh, like your get best guess as to where you think things will fall out, um, then we can discuss. Uh, you know, if, if you see something that, that gives some guidance as to where you, you think we should be looking the hardest at, that would be helpful. I can let you know that based on our annual evaluation of our units, we used to call them EDUs, now we're referring to them as FDEs, Rockford Dwelling Equivalent. That's the calculation that we use to determine the number of units that are charged for water surcharge and CSO surcharge. Those are tied to consumption. So we have seen a, another year of decrease in water and sewer consumption. So the drop in EDUs this year is going to result in a decrease in water surcharge revenue of about $27,000 is the estimate right now. And the CSO surcharge revenue, we're estimating a decrease of about $16,000. That's on the surcharge side. As far as water and sewer consumptions, while we've still seen a decrease this year, the, the rate of decrease is less this year than in prior years. The big decrease we saw this year was with Rossburg State, because as you recall last spring, when the university closed down and students left town, right. it has a severe drop in consumption. The trend among consumption of other customers is tending to be more consistent right now. I feel comfortable with the budget estimates that we have for the water and sewer revenue at this point in the year. Okay. So I would feel comfortable projecting similar revenue in the next year, assuming rates were unchanged. Um, from a real estate tax perspective, 
We did have an increase in our assessable base this year of about $7 million, but that was mainly from the nursing home going from tax exempt to taxable, the, the old miners hospital, that nursing home. So that was a, an increase to our overall real estate revenue of about $48,000 this year. So I, I don't have any other estimates right now that our real estate tax base will change significantly. Other revenue sources at this point from the budget that we've prepared, Maryland income tax revenue is a, a big source for us highway user revenue. We have not been provided any different estimates from the state as far as those changing, but the distributions to the city have been lagging behind. So for instance, highway user revenue, we've only had one distribution this year. So we will get a projection from the state, I would expect within the next three weeks of what they think those revenue sources would be next year but I do not have that information available right now. I can tell you that the, even among the special department requests that we've mentioned, um, I don't foresee being able to fit those into a balanced budget without additional revenue sources, whether that's from a real estate tax increase. Um, we don't have a lot of other sources available to us, so. I do see constraints there. We don't have a crystal ball, but that's no, just... of course we understand. I, I mean, just the, the idea you're looking at the numbers every day, and I know I know you were yeah. very diligent about that. So, um, you know, your recommendation as to how you need us to proceed would be, I think, would be helpful to us. If it, a, a change in the real estate rate, you know, for each penny change. Based on the current accessible base, you're looking at maybe another $34,000 of revenue based on, you know, assessments of similar to what they were last year. Right. I mean, I know we all know we're going to, we're, we're dealing with the increasing minimum wage and we want, I know we all want, want to stay ahead of that. Um, we've made some pretty great strides in bringing up our, the bottom end of the salary structure, I think we want to continue to go in that direction. So if, uh, again, like I said, I'm not trying to put all the weight of the world on your shoulders, but it, it's, it's definitely easier for us for you to tell us. And then I know what, what break points, I know you've done that before in the past and that's real helpful. So, if, you know, if it's a penny, if it's two pennies, um, you can, you let us know that. I know any kind of increases in rates are hard for the public to, to see, but when you do smaller increases at a gradual rate, I think that that's sometimes easier to absorb right. than having to take a big jump right there. So that would be one, one item for your consideration. Sure, sure. Well, and again, if we don't have to, to adjust anything on water and sewer, um, and, and, and that looks like it's gonna be okay, and hopefully we'll have a, have more kids back in the fall this year uh, at school. So that'll help our usage rates, which will help level things up a little bit too. Um, right. Then if we, if we need to look at real estate, then we look at real estate. Anybody else have any opinion? Okay. Well, again, Elaine, if you can help us a little bit and direct us as to you think a couple cents will get us over the next uh, budget cycle, then that's what we'll have to look to do. Okay. As we work towards the draft budget, we'll, we'll come up with some alternatives to present for your consideration and, and seek your direction. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Oh. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next item is um, last month you received some public comment about the recycling credit. And I just kind of put together um, a bunch of numbers for your consideration. 
there's no like magic number <laughs> that tells you what the recycling credit should be. Okay. But um, right now we only have 201 people participating in the recycling program with Berg Myers. <coughs> That's a reduction in about 50 people since the program first began. That credit um, is nine dollars um, a quarter. The garbage. This is for 2020, and I didn't correct it up there. But the garbage rate is actually thirty-five dollars. Was thirty-five dollars a quarter? It is now thirty-eight. Um, but looking at our landfill bills, including bulk pickup, um, our estimated tonnage for 2020 was a little over twenty-two. Um, thousand no 2200 tons and our frostburg census average household size is 2.29 people which works out to be an average pounds per day per person of 2.16 um, which is interesting when contrasted with the epa's average pounds per person per day of municipal waste which is 4.9 wow the EPA estimates that 32% of household waste is generally recycled. Um, so back to Frostburg, average annual waste per household per year per tons is just under one ton. So for the average customer, you're looking at about $52 in just landfill fees of the um, 140 that they pay for all of garbage. The problem, uh, if you go back to the top, is our garbage um, operating and administration expenses are about $370,000. And landfill costs last year were 117,000. So a large majority of the costs associated with collecting garbage are fixed costs. They're the people that ride on the garbage truck they are the cost of maintaining the garbage truck. They are the cost of the fuel, repairs, etc. Oil, grease, everything. So there comes a point where, when you look at this, if everyone participated in the recycling program, the city would be in a bad way with right. the current credit that it already is. Um, but then there's, all, there's the flip side of how do you incentivize it? Um, I have not, <coughs> since I've been administrator, um, I have not talked to Berg Myers about other options for recycling. Um, there's potentially um, different ways to encourage recycling but it's gonna come with a cost, which would be reflected in that monthly bill. Um, could we adjust our garbage rate to just include recycling for everyone? And we play Berg Myers to collect that. Um, or yesterday I saw a mini garbage truck and do we buy one of those and collect recycling in a mini garbage truck and have an agreement with Burr Myers to process that or some other option? Um, it just depends on how much of a priority um, encouraging recycling is to you. Um, at this point in time, uh, commodity prices are really low. Hopefully they're trending up but that's why recycling is so expensive for the individual customer. Um, in theory, I would think that if Berg Myers was collecting recycling at 2,400 homes instead of 200 homes, that um, the price per customer would go down um, because those fixed costs could be spread out over more homes. Um, but I don't really, the rec I don't have a strong feeling on what the recycling credit could be. I just know that assuming that it stays in the 200 to 300 people range, I don't think a dollar is going to get a lot of people to sign up. 
an additional dollar, $12 or $3, I'm sorry, $4 per year is going to make a big difference uh, to people, whether they want to recycle or not. I think the bigger factor is, is just the cost of it, of recycling. Yeah, I think the reason a lot of people ended up discontinuing it with through Bergmeier is that their costs went up and their um, cycle of pickups went down. So now they collect every three weeks. Um, I think before it was every two weeks, every other week. Um, and then I think the costs went, it, they went up quite dramatically. Um, so I have a feeling, I'm not quite sure, but I have a feeling that people who dropped out did not drop out of recycling. They're just using the county recycling um, or they're using, <laughs> or they're, du they're doubling up with their neighbors to recycle through a uh, Bergmeier or something like that. <laughs> Part of the problem I had with Bergmeier was they, they weren't picking it up. We stopped it this past year because we'd sit our stuff out when, when it was supposed to go out, they'd pick up the neighbors and ours would sit there. You know, they'd come halfway up Frost Avenue, turn around, go back down and, and just got tired of it. And I think I, I saw that a lot of posts like that on Facebook, you know, they, they, they weren't getting their stuff picked up. And so also there just, were problems with billing too. Like they, mm -hmm. people, they somehow they said you, they didn't receive your payment and then they picked up your uh, recycling bin like right away without it, giving you yeah. a chance to uh, actually iron out the problem. Yeah, I know there were frustrations with that. So it seems like the biggest thing is not recycling, but Bergmeier. <laughs> I don't think they're into recycling. <coughs> um, I'm wondering if we could work something out with uh, Sierra Wigfield from the county. Um, well, I think they're pretty busy too, though, with, you know, just keeping that going. I know they do really work very hard at the county to actually place all their stuff, you know, that they recycle into. So it actually goes into the recycling stream. I really don't know what Bergmeier does. Um, <laughs> I have not had a chance to tour their place. Um, I was trying to line it up um, before COVID and then COVID happened. So I never really got a chance to see what they actually do. Um, well, maybe one thing would be to just encourage people to, you know, advertise once again what the county recycles, you know, and, you know, what it, what it does with its various recycling streams, um, have Sierra do the rounds again with uh, advertising that, um, because the main thing is to try to get stuff out of, you know, keep it from going into the landfill. That's another um, point is with the landfill closing in a couple years. And um, I think they're gonna still keep the drop off site there, but I, I know there's been, I know having a recycling drop off site's difficult. Um, it has to be monitored, it gets dirty, it gets bees or whatever else. Um, it smells like stale beer. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, so, I mean, if I, it's my understanding that that's going to stay open. Um, yeah, I guess we could certainly reach out to Sierra for some advertising. And then if you want me to look at anything further um, in terms of curbside, just let me know. You, I will wait for your direction. Have you heard yet, like what is going to happen after the landfill closes? <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> well, Do we really want to talk about that? <laughs> heard a lot of different things. I'm really close to <laughs> retirement. <laughs> no, um, in tw I think I might have the dates off in 2020. Three, I believe the landfill will close, but because of our agreement with um, the county's agreement, I'm sorry, with waste management, the rate increases 
for the rates and allowed increases um, will continue to be governed by the existing agreement. And um, there is a transfer station down um, off of 220 behind the prisons. So unfortunately for Frostburg, um, we will have to drive our trucks to Crescent Town, but it does protect the rates through 2034, I believe. So um, we won't look at any significant increases um, till then. In terms of what, that gives Allegheny County some breathing room to figure it out. Um, but that's all I know at this point. That's what I've heard also. I guess we could sell burn barrels. <laughs> Not funny, Kevin. <laughs> Not funny, Kevin. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, you think about bringing some of the, the stuff like they have over at um, the landfill now for recycling, but I just don't think it, it being so close that we can really justify bringing that into the city. Yeah, two years ago we did like cardboard box. We had a special trailer for cardboard box recycling at Christmas time. That was successful, right. but um, that was a borrow program from the county. So we're kind of at mm -hmm. their mercy. Well, you know, I'd advocate for doing that because it, I mean, that trailer really filled up um, mm -hmm. numerous times. So yeah, if we can uh, work with the county to offer that again, especially, you know, around times like, you know, Christmas when there, there's a lot of ordering going on and lots of delivery boxes. I bet you there are a bunch of boxes now with uh, COVID and people ordering mm -hmm. stuff online. Oh, yeah. See, and that's where Kevin's idea of a burn barrel really comes <laughs> in. <laughs> We do not want a pall of smoke hanging over the city. I think that would go against uh, some of our other uh, initiatives. <laughs> How often, Les, does the uh, cardboard dumpster get uh, dumped? Oh, the one down by you. Yeah. I don't I'm know. I've, got, I've gotten complaints about it not being dumped. Yeah. There's like a secret secret cardboard dumpster that Berg Myers offers that is down off of Willow Drive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it was um, a secret. <laughs> it was just letting it out now. <laughs> but it's I mean it's available for city use um, that Bergmeyer provided as part of the um, agreement with the city to provide recycling service. So that one does exist, but it's a smaller one. Um, and it does overflow. I've got maybe maybe we it. can get you know maybe we can get a little bit you know get get uh, get in contact with them, Liz, and and uh, see about maybe getting another pickup or something like that. You know, and making that more public knowledge. Okay. You know, so residents can utilize that. Okay. That's a good idea because I mean the one thing that I don't recycle through Bergmeier is corrugated cardboard because they're so persnickety as to you know it has to be like two by two or less and tied in a bundle and it's like <sighs> I'm just gonna toss it in the trailer I, I just collect it until I get a car full and then I take it to the um, the county um, recycling. I did not know about the secret Bergmeier one. <laughs> it's, down by, it's down by the dog park. Oh, okay, now and I it know. Gets used. Yeah, it gets used. I took a bunch of stuff to it last week, and it was about three quarters. It's only a six-yard dumpster. Um, but, I mean, from what I can always tell, I, I don't know when they dump it because I don't have eyes on it all the time. But um, it seems to get used a lot. I know one of the local restaurants used it at least weekly. <clears throat> right, Donnie? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I thought it was yours, though. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get Max a truck, bud. I thought we could use my truck. <laughs> it sits over there all the time. 
right. Okay, so plan on leaving things as is, and um, I'll work on some other recycling information. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, okay. Liz. Thank you. All right. More fun topics. Um, election 2022. So, if you recall, in January, February of 2020, there was discussions about moving the election to the state election cycle and having the county do the elections for the city. That letter was sent and then COVID happened. And um, if the charter amendment would have had to have been made by last summer for everything to work out. So it's not gonna happen. It's just off the table, at least for 2022. Um, because of COVID and the governor's um, emergency orders regarding municipal elections, the city did pivot to a mail-in election with the opportunity to return ballots by mail or drop them to a delivery box. Um, if you didn't notice, I was very stressed out about all of that at the time. But you seemed um, fine to me. I didn't <laughs> <say it. laughs> In retrospect, um, it went really smoothly. We it used really third, did. We used a third party company for printing and we manually. So in the past, we had rented. Um, election machines that cost $9,000 to rent it. Um, or we had done manual hand count paper ballots. Um, the cost, so we had evaluated both for the 2020 election pre-COVID and decided to go with just the paper ballots um, and manually count them. And so then when we, you know, the COVID happened and we switched to the mail-in ballot, the cost of printing postage, all the envelopes and return postage was still less than what it cost to um, rent a voting machine. So I kind of wanted to talk to you about what format you would like your election in 2022 to be. Um, because we would need to start that charter amendment process now or soon so that it's taken care of by the end of this year before um, any election related activities begin. There is legislation, I have not followed it, um, but there is legislation, say, and I don't even know if it applies to all elections or just state elections that for any election um, you would have to be you would have to be mailed a ballot uh, similar to what Maryland did for the primary where you didn't have to request it you just got mailed it um, so I think the trend is going that way um, we had a thousand votes for an uncontested election, and I'm pretty sure over a thousand. And the last time we had an uncontested election for all five offices, I think there was 94 or 96 voters. Um, I should have put that slide that I prepared about the election turnout um, related to the mail-in election on here. Um, so I would not be opposed to um, doing mail out ballots uh, with the opportunity to either return ballots by mail or return ballots at a drop box. Um, the, if you were interested in pursuing a charter amendment that would reflect that permanently, um, some other considerations would be the turnaround time um, for public for announcing the final results, there would have to be a delay. Um, right now, I think the charter gives the election board two days um, and we would probably need much more time um, because of postmarking and just counting. 
if it was a contested election and there were, um, everyone was mailed a ballot with the options of delivering it or mailing it, you know, it's likely that you could get 2,000 or 2,500 votes. Um, and that would take some time to manually count. Or if we rented a voting machine, that would increase um, election costs. So I kind of just wanted to put it out there. I don't need a decision today, um, but um, just it's something that's gonna need to be talked about sooner rather than later. Yeah, I'm kind of two minds about it. Um, in a way, you know, having an election day seems like a good, like, it seems like a really nice civic participation opportunity. On the other hand, just the ease of voting by mail just gets a lot more people to actually vote. Um, so in that way, there's actually more civic participation. Right. <laughs> um, so I think like right now I'm leaning towards the, um, the mail-in with, you know, you can actually make drop-off be a nice civic participation thing. Um, you know, neighbors see each other, um, you know, when they're dropping off their ballots. So that, those are my thoughts so far. <laughs> Anybody else? No. So if I put this on March or April's agenda um, with maybe some a little more information, that sounds okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. fine, Liz. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, next item is the city place parking lot. My picture isn't working. Hmm. That's unfortunate. Okay. Um, <laughs> let me, I'm not gonna be able to bring it up. I don't know why that's not working. Okay, so the city place lot, which would be, let me see if I can, no, I'm going to bring it up on a map. Can you see the map screen coming up now, or do you still see the meeting agenda? We'll see the meeting. Okay, let me, let me switch my screen I'm sharing. Okay. Okay, so the lot I'm talking about is this upper lot that you pull in between the Clatter building and the model train building. Um, that lot is narrow and it is almost exclusively used by people that work or live in those buildings. Right now it is not metered and we do not um, allow overnight parking. Overnight parking had been occurring for some time um, because of a mild winter last year. And um, just, you know, I'm not out monitoring parking between two and 6 a.m. And, you know, this is just not a high, uh, area of concern, but when the snow plowing does happened uh, back in December, it became very difficult for our parks and rec crew to maintain this. So our police started issuing tickets and then people were upset again that they don't have parking. Um, this is what I would like to propose. The city has this parking lot right here 
in which um, half of the parking lot will be reserved for um, employees at the municipal center, 11 spaces, and 11 spaces will remain available to be um, leased monthly for parking permits. The police department never has more than three or four permits issued for this lot, um, but they are $20 a month and they administer that. That's the one between mechanic and um, park. And park, okay. What I would propose is coming up with an equitable way to allow people in the vicinity of this parking lot to purchase a parking pass. That would be good for during the day and overnight. What that would mean is that our parks and rec department would come in and plow the snow to this corner like they do now and people would still would have to shovel out their own vehicles if they can't get in and around them. Um, but they get prime parking in the center of town. And they, we would do, um, right now there's some spots reserved for Dr. Tan that I don't know how they came to be. They pay nothing. Right now, there's some reserved for Somerset Trust that were a carryover from the BB&T. <clears throat> Barb Armstrong owns one or two parking spaces behind her building, but the ones behind the vapor room, they do not own, the city owns. So it's just kind of a mess. And I, would and I know that there's a lot of people that work and live in this area, and it would be nice to accommodate them and also generate some revenue for the city to help maintain and repair things like this retaining wall that's falling over um, and address the stormwater issues that are causing that retaining wall failure. So I, before I went any further with that, um, I wanted to discuss it with you to see if that's an idea that you're amenable to that then I could come up with a more detailed proposal of what it would look like. And you're just talking about the upper lot, not yes. the lower. Yes. I, this lower lot, it may make sense to meter it um, to keep people from parking there all day um, and abuse. Those are some, that's a nice little parking lot. And, um, there's a lot of businesses on Broadway. It would be nice to make sure that those are reserved for people visiting the businesses um, or patients um, of Dr. Tans or what have you. Um, but it, it would be nice to um, keep the cars moving through that lot. So Liz, we own this upper lot, correct? Mm -hmm. Except but for the two spaces or one space behind um, Barb, Arm Barb and Slug Armstrong's building. Okay, and then some of the spaces go to the bank. Yes. Correct. And some go to Dr. Tan. Right now. Who's no, who's no longer there. <laughs> oh, great. So, I mean, do we have agreements with them? Is that? Right now, Somerset Trust is paying us. Um, I'm I think they could be flexible as long as they had an opportunity to purchase passes at what the new rate would be um, right. and take their turn in terms of the, um, or, you know, get their um, allocation or what have you um, equitably with the other folks. I think like that's something that I'm struggling with personally is like, I have, that those Dr. Tan spaces, the employees have written Dr. Tan employees on the sign. And it's like, well, we don't do that for anyone else. Like that's not what my understanding is the intent, the original intent of providing guaranteed parking was for patients. So um, I, I have no 
um, qualms right now with knowing what I know about um, dissolving that <laughs> relationship and just giving them a fair opportunity with all the other business owners um, and residents to buy a pass. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And, and it really is a awkward lot. Um, I park in these Somerset Trust spots right now um, when there's something at City Place. And like, it's all I can do when there's cars over here to back up. So it's not necessarily a lot we would encourage the public to use anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good to me. But that does bring up the question of where city employees are going to park um, once the municipal center is complete. So, are they um, going to use the one, that one between um, mechanic and park? Yeah, we have 11 spaces up here and the mayor is working on an agreement for six additional spaces in this lot here, okay, which would yeah. cover the amount of employees we have working at any given time. Great, that's good. Would the, those permits be the only ones that the city then would issue for parking or do we have other permit agreements anywhere else? This ha the half of this lot we do issue permits for, but we have very few, mm -hmm. um, three to four a month at the most. Before the lots were open, you know, uh, where we're talking about there behind or beside Clatter, uh, bb and t and before them first national they would release i believe with three or four spaces in what we call the upper permit lot which is a lot between uh by what was dr Steele's building <coughs> and park um they would come in every month with a check and we'd write them a receipt and hand them their three or four new permits and away they'd go and then we decided to make that a a yearly permit situation just to cut back on paperwork Mm -hmm. um, but that lot that we're talking about now, um, beside Clatter, that really didn't exist. Okay. So are you okay with me putting together um, a proposal for that? Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I think, <clears throat> like you yeah. said, that'd be maybe a, a, not, not so much a lottery type of deal, but we'll come up with something that's fair and equitable that it would be do a round one, maybe and then a round two or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar to what I was thinking, Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, and if I get something together and have a chance to reach out to the property owners in the vicinity um, before next month, I will do that. Okay. Okay. That's all I had. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. oh, that picture finally came up. Do you like that? You probably can't <laughs> see it. Oh, see. There's Just, that high uh, quality map I made. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Green magic marker. Uh, I think that's number to Adam, Nina, and I tomorrow at two o'clock at City Place, along with Elizabeth. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. That's on your calendar. Yes. Okay. And other than that, I'm good. So till we meet again next week. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Anything else? Liz, Elaine, Brian, all thank you. Thank you. Okay.